Hello everyone, this is Sam of Historian Explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and other platforms. If you can help to keep them coming, please go to my Patreon page and support at any level you can. I am getting fairly close to my goal of 200 patrons, at which point hopefully I can collaborate with a producer to produce videos and work on music, film, any number of other sorts of materials that are hard to license. But this week, I interviewed my friend and fellow historian, Margarita Fajardo, who is a Colombian-American historian and a professor of Latin American history at Sarah Lawrence College. And I discussed with her her very rich and multi-layered book titled The World That Latin America Created, The United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America in the Development Era, which came out from Harvard University Press earlier this year. As we'll discuss, the book centers on a very influential movement of economists, scholars, statesmen, and stateswomen in Latin America in the mid-20th century, which Fajardo argues had a global impact using ideas that were developed from the vantage point of the global South, specifically the southern part of South America. As she says in her introduction, quote, Since their project emerged from the global south and expanded to the rest of the world, Cepalinos effectively inverted the traditional directionality of world-making. So you could say that in an almost literal sense, this book is about a world turned upside down. As it happens, Margarita is also going to have a book opening this coming Saturday, the 24th of September at 11 a.m., The location is the bookshop Recirculation, which is one of the branches of the Word Up Community Bookshop, located at 876 Riverside Drive, just below 160th Street in Washington Heights, New York City. And be aware, Word Up Community Bookshop has two different locations. So Margarita's book opening will be at Recirculation at 876 Riverside Drive near 160th Street, Washington Heights. And again, that'll be on Saturday the 24th at 11 a.m. Margarita, of course, will be there. I will be as well. So if there are any listeners in New York or the New York area, if you want to hear from the author, then both of us will be there. And I will put those details into the show description so you can see them in writing as well. So now to hear directly from Margarita herself about her research and about what she wanted to convey that was so important about this Cepalino movement, here is the interview with Margarita. Thank you for joining Historian Splaining. Welcome, Margarita. Oh, thank you, Sam, for having us. I'm very excited to be this wonderful podcast. So your book, The World That Latin America Created, is about an economic school of thought and an economic movement that you argue rose to a position of not only great influence, but even of dominance in Latin America in the post-war era, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and then even had a global impact, you argue. And you call this movement Cepalino and the people who participated in it, Cepalinos, because it came together around this institution based in Santiago de Chile called Cepal, C-E-P-A-L. So just to begin from the beginning, what is Cepal and why was it so impactful? Yeah, well, CEPAL, as you said, is like an institution in Chile. CEPAL is the acronym in Spanish for the Comisión Económica para América Latina. It's an institution affiliated to the UN. Part of other, like there are other regional commissions in Europe and Asia, or there, there were established initially for reparations for the war. And Latin Americans thought that uh, Latin America, even, even though it was not like a war theater, not suffered physical devastation or or any of the other sort of factors that justify the creation of regional commissions within the UN, but that still had participated in the war effort and suffered economically from the consequences of the war and 
most importantly will suffer from post-war reconstruction so uh at the at the global level so i think uh so cepal was the result of a chilean diplomatic initiative to use the un to create a to get some discussion about the economic problems of latin america at the global level so that is uh cepal established in 1948 and still existing today perhaps in different not 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 the same kind of uh, not the same sort of movement and not not playing the same roles i would say that it used to but still there today as an important uh, regional reference yeah so so you point out that although latin america was not a direct theater of war those nations did take part in the allied war effort and a lot of people don't know brazil even sent troops into the second world yeah. war right and played a, an important role so, so CEPAL is set up under the auspices of the UN to deal with the question of how to develop the economy and help the economies of Latin America to grow and recover. But you say that there was this central problem that the economists and the statesmen around CEPAL had to confront, the so-called development paradox. So what can you tell us what's the development paradox? Yeah, but let, yeah, for sure. But let me have go back to one one thing that I, I think it would be worth for the listeners to kind of understand about CEPAL. I mean, I think CEPAL is not like, is not an academic institution, is not a, you know, think tank, is not bringing sort of scholars or intellectuals together per se. So I the initial impetus behind the organization had nothing or not very much to do with the production of ideas. So in, in some ways, it's sort of like a surprise or a paradoxical turn of events that this institution that is supposed, that is in a way some form of part of this international bureaucracy becomes the sort of center of, uh, of this intellectual movement. So I, I just wanted to, to go back to kind of that, to give the uh, listeners a sense of, of what CEPAL is. But go, to go to your question about the development paradox. So many of these, uh, the kind of economies by training, by also by practice that ended up becoming the sort of core group of CEPAL began thinking about the problems of Latin America. And they characterized the world economy as divided between center and peripheries. So they were concerned with the Latin America as a periphery of the world economy. And what is the periphery? The peripheries are the regions of the world that are producing raw materials for the industrial centers of the world and that have a particular problem that is that they confront the long-term decline in the terms of trade. That is, they're getting less, less and less money over time for the for their products, like their their raw materials they're selling, either be it copper or be it bananas or etc. A whole range of, of of sort of primary products, and they are getting the problem was that they're getting money less and less money uh, from trade. So the development paradox is part of this problem, I guess, because. What Cepalinos sort of conceptualize as the problem that uh, a policy problem that needs to be resolved is the need for more international trade to solve those kind of problems created by international trade. So some problems like shortage of foreign exchange or balance of payments problems that were recurrent and creating inflationary crisis that were recurrent throughout the uh, post-war period were driven by these, they thought, dependence on international trade. And the paradox is that some of the solutions required more trade. So that's that's the kind of fundamental problem. Right. And it seems as if the obvious response might be, well, let's build up industry and manufacturing in the periphery nations, like in Latin America, so that we don't have to depend on these imported manufacturers. But in order to do that, you have to import huge amounts of material, technology, people with expertise. So there seems to be this sort of trap where when you try to become more independent, you in fact become more and more dependent. And this was sort of the paradox right. of trying to escape. And, and you explain that they to try to get out of this trap, they have sort of three tools, more trade, right? But also more fair trade, right? They mm -hmm. wanted things like price stabilization so that they don't have to worry about 
ups and downs in the price of say coffee or copper or silver or whatever they're exporting aid. So for the major industrialized centers to extend um, grants or loans, I assume, right? And then third, regionalism. And this was very interesting. So a lot of these say Paulino thinkers and statesmen advocated that Latin America should uh, integrate its markets, right? And mm -hmm. in a way was looking to Europe and the, the EU and European integration as kind of a, a model to follow. And what did they right. see that they could gain then? Why, why did they see that as a pathway to get out of this rut they were in? Well, the, I, one of the problems when that regionalism was supposed to solve was expand the size of the national market. Uh, so some of these countries like, and does take advantage of like the economies of scale that industry requires. Like for them, they sort of sort of thinking, well, it doesn't make much sense to kind of create big steel industries in each country of Latin America when there's not enough demand to sustain the investment for that industry. But if you could coordinate the different industries across countries, then that would solve the problem of the economies of scale. Of course, this was very politically hard because nobody wants to be the one, no country wants to be the one kind of left behind or with the less value in less value adding industries, let's say. So all of them felt like there was a need for them to have steel industries or or have other ones of the basic um, basic um, industries uh, to produce more capital goods. So that was the problem of coordination and 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 I guess that that we see in the global level as well uh, was particularly important for the for limiting the ability to create these regional communities. Although. You know, there are some, they're not, it's not all failures, I would say, but I'm still kind of going. That's only <laughs> something I started working with in this book. And I, I something that I'm interested in pursuing sort of a little bit farther in a, in a future project. Yeah, I think that that's an interesting question that sort of runs through the whole book is that you show how these people had such a huge impact on thinking and also on policy in Latin America. But you sort of have to think, well, like, what were their big successes? Like, there were mm. so many setbacks and so many obstacles. Yeah. But you you emphasize that they, they really put forward a way of viewing the world. And you keep saying mm. that they were engaged in a project of world making. And can you, can you explain a little bit what you mean? And I think you say at one point, there's sort of a double meaning there. What do you mean by world making? Yeah, and I guess uh, sort of you you make the first question of their successes um, um, as yeah. well, which is it's it's a hard one to kind of uh, tackle. And I think the successes have, as you rightly said, it have to do with this world making project that the results did not end up being exactly what they envisioned. And to me, it was not like a, a sign of failure necessarily, but. Uh, but instead the, their ability to kind of insert themselves in many different political projects and to generate policies and ideas and, and, and different projects and make them of interest to different constituencies and groups was their success. And so part of these are ideas um, are those that are world making. So I talk about world making because in a way, they do create a view of the world as described by the concept of center and periphery that, that we were talking about later. And also with some other concept that emerged out of the center periphery concept, the one of dependency. And those worldviews were meaningful and were the foundation of these multiple projects that I was talking about and that perhaps we're gonna talk a little bit more later on. And I think those because they sort of were able to either personally, you know, as individuals to insert themselves in these projects or, or because their concepts led to certain political projects, I do think that they reshaped the world. And 
in Latin America, but also in other parts of the world that incorporated some of these concepts and mobilized them in their own political projects. So that's why I think that the meaning of, of the world that Latin America created is sort of double, as you pointed out. It, it points to those two directions, kind of intellectual, conceptual, and their ability to reshape the world they were living in through those ideas. Yeah, and there's and part of this duality is you you always emphasize that these ideas were rooted in Latin America and in the experience of Latin America. They have this distinctive origin. And yet that basic concept of center versus periphery and how to balance and negotiate between center and periphery is also transferable. And it was taken up a lot by African leaders and in Asia, mm -hmm. it has this kind of global implication to make it more clear, so what was so special and important about and distinctive about the Cepalinos, there's this interesting contrast with traditional modernization theory, right? And, and you say they, there are sort of these fundamentally different vocabularies and different metaphors between the sort of modernization theory that we might be more familiar with in the United States as opposed to the Cepalino view of center versus periphery. So how would how would a, an, a modernization theorist maybe talk differently about trying to bring about development in a place like Brazil or Colombia? Yeah, oh, let me let me talk about that. Again, you mentioned two things that I, I would like to talk right. about <laughs> there. Like, so the first thing is like, how do their, their distinctive origin in Latin America? So Part of the work that I did was to, that's something that they claim of themselves. So part of my work, like to, to identify their, their, their ideas and their policies as distinctively Latin American. But of course, nobody knows or, or nobody, not a lot of people can and even them agree on what is that is it that is distinctly Latin American. You know, what is that that uh, is local or whatever regional that that makes this uh, particular distinctive. So in the book, I, I try to explore that a bit. What exactly of Latin America, what are the kind of historical processes? What are the context? What is the background that is driving these stories? And that in some ways allows one to say like, okay, yes, this emerging from the context of the region as a whole. And also to say in what ways this is a rhetorical device on the part of these um, group of this cohort of intellectuals and policymakers and ideals to represent themselves in the world. So, so I, I, I try to try to do these two things uh, at once. I, I don't know, maybe that was, that was too, too much of having your cake and eat it, but I, I try to hold these two things at the same time uh, in the book. And sort of second, what distinguishes their vocabulary? So, so I think uh, you rightly pointed out that they they were trying to provide a vocabulary that was different from those dualities of backwardness and progress that implied like some unique path, a um, unique and linear path to development, and that in a way sort of imagined that in a way that the context didn't matter, sort of like there was just one mechanism and that everybody had to go through the same process, regardless of the conditions of the um, historical moment and the political and the economic conditions of the historical moment in which development was taking place. So for them, it mattered that, uh, you know, that Latin America was engaging in this and other world or the regions of the periphery in the industrialization process in the middle of the 20th century and not say in the late 18th century or in the early 19th century or in the late 19th century as, as you know, as say, you know, Germany or, or Japan, you know, like the context did matter. And for them that justified a particular set of policies that in their mind also involved the cooperation between the periphery and those countries that were now or then um, already industrialized, let's say. So, so they were definitely trying to distinguish themselves in, in or provide a vocabulary that was alternative to that. One might sort of criticize them for, even though the vocabulary was different and it implied a recognition that the context matter, the time and place and geopolitics of the, uh, in which it happened mattered. They were also kind of 
following the trajectory was industrialization, the strategy that was in some ways privileged, although as, as we were talking before, accompanied by these other three pillars that we discussed when we were discussing the development paradox. Yeah, and sort of the way I thought of it when I was trying to understand it all is that there's this body of sort of development theory, which is clearly influenced a lot by Marxism and dialectical materialism, and which uses these temporal metaphors, that there are like stages of history, and therefore you can take a country like Mexico or Venezuela and say, look at them in isolation and say, what stage of development are you at? And how do we move you from point A to point B? Whereas the Sepalinos were saying, no, they were using this spatial metaphor about how the, all these different countries fit into uh, relationships with one another and how the dynamics of trade, the flows of trade are really fundamental to then what each country can do, right? And and they were putting them into this this global picture, which seems, you know, really, it does seem pathbreaking. And it struck me that this book is sort of recovering a way of looking at the situation of countries, of developing countries, and particularly of Latin America, that it seems to me like Americans don't think about or are totally unaware of, even if they are educated. Like I took a class in modern Latin America and learned some good things. And the professor was a Brazilianist. And I could say, yeah, I know who Goularch is. I know who Vargas is. Like it was not totally alien to me. But it seems like the American assumption is like, on the one hand, there are these sort of popular left movements, these sort of uh, movements of resistance. And then on the other hand, there's the big evil United States and the United States wants to impose monetarism, free markets, neoliberalism, right? Neoliberalism is this term that's, it's been around a long time, but it's sort of come more into people's vocabulary. And that's it. it. Those are the two forces that clash. And people think of these, you know, terrible moments like the coup in Chile in 1973, and they see them in terms of the confrontation between the sort of popular left forces within the country and the sort of American hegemon, which is neoliberal, monetarist, pro-capitalism. And this book, to me, it seems like, well, you're saying there's this whole other third position that was not one or the other. And in a sense, everybody was responding to that. Like this was the real dominant way of, of approaching things on in Latin America. So, you know, to me, that strikes me as historically significant. But I sort of want to understand more like, why do you think that's so important? Like, what do you want people to get from this? Is it mainly about showing that Latin Americans could have control over their own destiny? They weren't just victims of outside forces. Or do you think there are actual ideas and policies here that should be revived that might still be relevant or useful? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> a lot was was you packed a lot of <laughs> of, of the book in just, in that, in just that uh, last intervention. Um, OK, I think that so first in terms of the political landscape that you were talking about in the beginning, I did try to kind of recreate a sort of more nuanced landscape than than the sort of like right wing allied to the US versus uh, sort of left wing uh, popular and show a wide variety of options and and show exactly how the Cepalinos with their particular ideas and even the independentistas who were their critics, but on some other hands or to their followers were able to kind of insert themselves into different kind of, of of all these different political projects like you know participate in many in in many of them some of which were kind of in opposition or in in um or in ideological at least um opposition to each other so i don't know if i would call but i guess maybe like that sepalinos were a third way but at least they they saw themselves the framework that they used and the the diagnosis that they had created was malleable enough that it could that many of them could take in very different directions i guess i guess is um, sort of what i would say and to the question of like the kind of broader goal of the book i think part of it was to 
a lot, I guess, and it's not coincidence that I am Colombian and I guess I'm Latin American, you know, initially trained in, in Bogota, but I did my final graduate school here. I write in English. It is no coincidence that, that then I was responding um, to this um, particular audience and sort of saying uh, there is a lot that is going on um, in Latin America and a lot of options and possibilities and alternatives and not just marginal ones is the point that I wanted to make. Not just marginal ones that are resisting from the, you know, from the edges of the political landscape and from the remote areas of the continent or even of the of the country, but pretty much centri centrally located in the centers of power in the region that have other ideas and projects and that were able to shape many of the decisions and many of the, for better or worse, right? Like that goes back to the question, are these policies to be rescued? Well, so for better or worse, they managed to influence the path and the policies taking in, 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 in some critical instances in the post-war era. And to me, that was, that was worth showing. In part because a lot of, I guess, precisely because of the dominance of this vocabulary that, as you said, of, of neoliberalism and that is with us today, we, we tend to think that that was meant to dominate or has always dominated. And what I wanted to show was the, the extent to which there were these other alternatives that were actually dominant and to which the neoliberals had to kind of displace out of their place of um, displace out of their displace out of their position, I guess, of, of power. The question of whether these policies are, are useful and, and in, in the way should be resurrected, I think is one that is particularly salient now. And I'm thinking of the of Colombia's recently elected president who has now like just launched these ideas of creating a, a consensus based and kind of community based uh, development plan. Something that has, you know, development plan seems to me like something like a, like a relic of the past that is mm. being resurrected. And so I think a lot of these, the question about the legacies and the extent to which these policies can be uh, reapplied now is one that is very much of interest to me and that I'm trying to pursue as well. The, what happened to these policies after the golden era? So, so that I will, you know, I don't have an answer. But, I mean, I have hints of answer, but let's wait till I, <laughs> I get to that once I research a bit more. Thanks, the next, yeah. book, right? the next book right but but yeah i think you you do explain there's this crucial central idea of a kind of economic planning that the sepalinos advocated that was not a completely planned economy but it was looking at what are sort of the crucial missing links or the crucial bottlenecks that we need and then sort of strategically focusing on building them up while continuing this international trade, right, without withdrawing out of the international economy. And they also dealt in different ways they had to deal with inflation, right? So inflation, I thought this was strangely, like, timely, <laughs> like, because people are talking about inflation here today. And there's a lot of people just immediately revert into this notion that, Oh, it's because the workers are getting paid too much, right? Wage price spiral. And what we have to do is like have more unemployment or somehow suppress wages. That's the only way to stop this inflation. But you explain that the these Sepalino economists, they argued for what they called a structural approach to inflation. Can you tell us basically what what is the structural approach? Yeah, um, the a structural approach sort of emerged in contrast, I guess, or or, or rather the way we conceptualize it now uh, was as in contrast to monetary approach uh, to inflation. And what it emphasizes is like, what are the, as you were saying, sort of the bottlenecks or the structural problems in, the, in a particular economy it emerged when these economists were thinking about Chile in particular and sort of evolved 
as they move from thinking about Chile to thinking about Brazil and with it, the structural approach to inflation sort of kind of metamorphosed, anyway, changed. Good, yeah. But what they were emphasizing for the particular case of Chile, for instance, was that there were limitations in the amount of, in the agricultural sector, in the amount of food that was available for the population and that that drove prices up. So that was one of the factors, for instance, one of those structural factors. And the other one had to do with the structure of the international system. Again, the problem, the, the structure of international trade, that because of the, they, the kind of referring back to the development paradox, because for industrialization, for the development process, you needed, or these countries needed more capital goods, and those were imported, and those were kind of getting more expensive vis-a-vis the products that were produced uh, for export in the region that also pushed prices up. So they were advocating, well, the, the implications of these structural causes of inflation is that are that for one, that inflation is a product of the process of development itself. So some that led some people to characterize the Palinos as sort of tolerant to inflation or kind of inflation prone in a way. And the other important implication is that uh, not only policies or measures that control the money supply, such as like interest rate or the amount of money that the government spends, are necessary to control inflation, that there's more that needs to happen. The kind of the way this is kind of applicable or not, I think there's many kind of discussions that are, are going now about other policies that can be applied and that were applied in Latin America. I see, for instance, a lot of recommendations and the European Union also turning to something called pr- price controls, which were very much used in Latin America throughout the post-war period, but that created a tremendous, also tremendous amount of problems because it was like layers upon layers of price controls. There's a moment in which we become very, very hard to manage. But that's not to say that those are not useful, but that's also Latin America sort of also provides an example of the many different mechanisms that were used to deal with kind of what they call like, like moderate inflations, you know, high, but not, but not hyperinflations, let's say. That's sort of like a different beast. So the, the inflations that we're talking about in the 1950s and 1960s, and even, even in the early 70s, are like these moderate inflations that are important and do change uh, the pattern of economic activity and economic life, but are not the hyperinflations that we will see in the, in the 1980s. So as you mentioned before, this movement in this school of thought eventually split, right, in the 1960s and 70s. It was sort of an internal schism. And firstly, you, the way you describe it, there were sort of two big incidents that presented challenges and that the Cepalinos couldn't exactly figure out how to respond to best. And mm-hmm. one is the Cuban Revolution, which was a left-wing revolution. And then the other was the Alliance for Progress, this aid movement for aid and development sponsored by the United States, which was as you explained, was largely a response, right, to the Cuban Mm -hmm. revolution, kind of the U.S. trying to reach out and say, we'll help you, just don't, just don't do a revolution. Mm -hmm. So how did, how did firstly the Cuban revolution challenge and create a crisis for Cepalinos? Well, I, I, I think that uh, the so sort of these events, you know, the one is sort of the response to the other, like the Alliance for Progress from the Cuban Re- to the Cuban Revolution. They're sort of happening kind of ad- contemporary, contemporaneously. Mm-hmm. Right? And so the the effect of these two events is that in as you were saying, it split Cepalinos. Some Cepalinos thought that the Cuban Revolution was the kind of mechanism, the culmination of their ideas. Other Cepalinos thought that the Alliance for Progress was the mechanism to really take these ideas to the next level, let's say, and really cause profound changes in the economic structures of the region and therefore to cause for development. The Cuban Revolution, I think the experience of the Cuban Revolution, like Cepalinos, some Cepalinos became like, um, well, they 
provided technical assistance and it was more like an institutional service to the revolution. But some Zeppelinos also became part of the revolution, becoming like ministers of the economy or special advisors and etc. The institutional response of CEPAL at some point after the initial engagement of Cepalinos with the revolution was to disengage and distance itself and sort of in sort of way, in a symbolic way, sort of break ties with the revolution. The effect was tremendous because I think it discredited the institution, if not all Cepalinos or not all their ideas, but in partly also their ideas, uh, got discredited at the as this sort of progressive or kind of radical view of development first. So they got discredited in the eyes of the left, right? Like in the eyes of, of the intellectual left, it, it, the Cepal and Cepalinos sort of were um, discredited. Some, obviously some other statesmen and diplomats sort of applauded the decision of uh, distance them, of, of Cepal distancing itself from Cuba. So that was an important moment because it accompanied with what happened with the Alliance for Progress, it created the context for the emergence of a new generation of intellectuals that were both critics and followers of Cepalinos that are the dependentistas, um, whose ideas kind of have important um, influence in the social sciences at, all, all over the world. And the Alliance for Progress, on the other, on the other hand, was also important for Cepal because it was sort of like the kind of last attempt to get that cooperation from the center, in that case, from the world economic hegemon, like the United States, and see it failing, let's say. See it, some of the ideas being co-opted or corrupted, and also that the power was taken away from them, even though they thought this was like a culmination of their ideas. They actually saw them being taken away from them, like sort of kind of stolen and misused. So I think that also pushed some of the, some of the Cepalinos to search for other alternatives, alternatives, some of which, for instance, were like, we need more, like push them towards more radical options in some cases, but also push them to other kind of options, like looking cooperation at the global level and not just sort of in a way the hemispheric level and incorporating other places of the periphery into uh, the conversation about the transformation of their relation, of the transformation of the world economy. So those were the important um, effects. Yeah, and I thought this was one of the most striking stories in the book was about this Brazilian economist, Celso Furtado, who created a whole elaborate plan for how to transform the economy of the Northeast of Brazil, which was viewed by many as sort of backwards. It was still based a lot around sugar plantations. It was seen as kind of less modern than Southern Brazil, which had industries. And he created this whole plan for how to relocate people, bring in new industries, just transform things. And then he sees the Alliance for Progress come along and he says, oh, this is great. We can just plug in this American aid into this project that I've worked out. But instead these Americans come and say, no, 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 we're just gonna do things like have mobile clinics and drinking fountains mm -hmm. and these sort of almost just charitable projects mm -hmm. instead of industrial development or, or transformation. They see it as sort of charitable aid and they want the, like the mobile clinics to be labeled Alliance for Progress mobile clinics, right? They want to get all this credit and make people like America, but it all, the whole thing kind of fell apart because they had such radically different aims of what they thought this was going to accomplish. So, so as you explain, I think you describe the emergence of this sort of new, this kind of Young Turks new movement that in a lot of ways draws on the Cepalinos and learns mm -hmm. from them, but also is critical, sees itself as more radical, and they're responding to these crises you've been talking about. And also it seemed as if the Cepalinos were kind of victims of their own success, that they mm -hmm. had actually achieved a lot of new development and industrialization, especially in Brazil and some other countries too, but then poverty didn't go away, right? There was still yeah. tremendous poverty, tremendous inequality. There was still this struggle to keep up with the United States and Europe. And people started to say, hey, <laughs> we've built up all these industries, but who owns them, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're owned by foreign 
investors, foreign companies, et cetera. It's not, it hasn't been the sort of transformation we were hoping for. And you say that they talked about not exactly a development paradox anymore, but a development impasse, right? So can you, can you tell us what is, what then is the development impasse? Yeah. So this new sort of cohort, as you were saying, that it were sort of kind of friends and enemies, allies, and also opponents of the Cepalinos have other have, well, have other intellectual sort of genealogies that I can we can discuss if there is time, but more importantly, are interested in what we could call the political economy of development, sort of like the classes, the interests, the coalitions, the political alliances, the alliances within the state that sustain the project of development. So, so Cepalinos in some way kind of thought of the state as in, in, in some ways as this neutral actor that, that was, depends on who was sort of like directing it, that could be like as a lever for enacting sort of policies and moving things in a particular direction. And dependentistas were sort of interested in opening up that sort of state structure and like kind of seeing what were the classes and interests and alliances that were behind the development project. So there's that sort of intellectual interest. So what they see as historically when they come along in the early um, 1960s is what they see as the development impetus is sort of that obstacles or, or when that coalition, when and how that coalition falls apart. So the development impetus is like the break of the coalition of different interests that had brought together like labor with capital and, and the bureaucrats of the state um, uh, have brought together into a, a particular coalition that has sustained industrialization for over 30 years, but was breaking apart at the moment in part due to the increasing role of foreign interests, which was not coincidental, right? This was part of the development strategy. This was calculated that what they needed was additional investment and to got all those technology and, and machines and equipment and parts that were needed for industrialization. So that other actor sort of was changing the balance between the alliance that had sustained development. So that's where they're seeing the crossroads in the 1960s that some of them, and some of them interpret the military coup in Brazil in 1964 as, as the symbol as the, of that rupture or that fracture in the alliance of classes and interests and, and political alliances that has sustained development up to that point. Yeah, and you explain how these dependentistas, a lot of them, uh, were more influenced by Marx. They took Marx very seriously and they sort of criticized the Cepalinos for not doing enough political analysis of the contending classes and mm -hmm. interests. And it seems a lot of the split is about how you view the national bourgeoisie, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the older generation sort of had this hope that the kind of national middle class, the entrepreneurial class would be, would lead this, this kind of transformation. And the dependentista said, no, 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 you can't really trust them, right? They, <laughs> they may want development, but when push comes to shove, they will defend their class position, right? And yeah. they will. And they, yeah, were, I, they were no longer defending, and that defending of that class position sometimes means breaking with the nation, like the alliances mm -hmm. of what was supposed to be the nation, and instead uh, seeking an alliance with foreign um, capitalists. Yeah, and and the two countries where the Cepalinos had the greatest impact were Chile and Brazil, right? And we can think of Brazil, they had the military staged a coup, took over the government in 1964. And right. then there was the infamous coup in Chile in 1973. And it seems that in, you can, from reading your book, it seems that there's, there's a tension in how you look at those events, especially the coup mm. in Chile, a tension between seeing it as this sort of imperial act by the United States. And we know the United States was definitely involved and helped it and encouraged it. But then on the other hand, seeing it as an effect of the internal conflict mm -hmm. and struggle in those societies, right? Right. And so it seems to resonate, I think, with your, with your point that we can't just see Latin America as sort of a pawn being controlled mm -hmm. by outside powers, that these were 
complicated dynamics people were trying to figure out within the region and within these countries. Right, right, for sure. Yeah, 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 that's that's definitely behind. And and although, you know, all, all the book is not necessarily about, it's not a political history, let's say. Uh, it does, this is the context in which the Cepalinos are acting and enacting their ideas so it becomes relevant to both understanding their project and to understanding what the project the impact that their project has on these processes that are uh, ongoing and then finally as you say you, you bring this up in the middle of the book and then again at the epilogue how dependency theory sort of goes global and mm -hmm. when I think about dependency theory I I do I do think of Latin America but also the the only name I think I could have pulled out of my head if someone said dependency theory, world systems, I would say Wallerstein, right? Emmanuel right. Wallerstein, who, as it happens, was an American, and he was an American working on Africa, right? Studying Africa. Mm -hmm. But as you explain, like the world systems theory couldn't have come about without this background of dependency theory coming from the Latin American experience. So do you think that 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 informs or should change how we look at, say, Wallerstein's world systems theory, if we know that this is this was sort of the inspiration that it came from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, I mean, there's always this time with tracing sort of genealogies of ideas and, you know, who comes first and who's, you know, the originality <laughs> is like a constant battle in, in our our histories and, and their histories, right? Like uh, as producers of ideas, intellectuals are interested in defending the originality of their own ideas. They're invested in that um, struggle. So so I think that the what I what I tried to do in the book was to show the bridges that were created between these dependency theories and the later more famous, as you say, world system theorists. I think for people at the time, they would have seen these all part of like, sort of like echoes of the same problem all over the world. But I think what I try to show in the book is that there was a sense, for instance, and this is just by, by evidence of Samir Amin, which is became one of these world system theorists of saying like, I am looking at the, he is an economist working in and on Africa and he sees them as the vanguard. He sees, so he's a person who's sitting at the, this, the exact moment, like at the time and place and sees these Latin America, these dependency theorists as the vanguard uh, knowing that these other things are happening sort of in the rest of the world. So I don't, I didn't want to make, you know, all this huge point of saying like, oh, this come first and we should all, you know, revise our like, you know, understanding of history and like claim that propriety and that originality. But I do think it's worth showing and thinking about it. And the other thing I tried to do in the book is sort of as I was sort of saying before, show how these the dependentistas themselves and maybe with this other well system theorist, they are battling, like show how they are trying to defend a position and gain a position from themselves as originators of certain ideas or or not, right? Some of them are trying to say, like, I didn't say that, you know, like you you are kind of mischaracterizing the either the concept or the uh, thrust behind uh, a particular a particular concept. So I was also interested in, in showing this the the role of Latin Americans that as you say was sometimes like not or not as widely known or recognized, but also showing how these battles of originality are part of the history of, of ideas. A few a few other things about the book I wanted to get to if we have time. One is about the style and sort of look of the book, which is really interesting to me. So English is not your first language. Mm -hmm. uh, Spanish you might have is your native language. <laughs> I have full disclosure, I've I've heard you speaking Spanish with your family all the time. This is this is your world. But I think the book is written very pithily and elegantly. I was able to follow some very conceptual stories, you know, which is totally outside my field. Economic history, modern Latin America, not my field at all. But it, it struck me as very readable. And also there's a there's like a role 
to the the informality of a lot of the vocabulary mm. and you sort of you call the the protagonists you get into their lives their careers these people like Raul Prebisch and and Santa Ana and Celso Furtado and you refer to them collectively as Cepalinos which strikes me as like a little funny right it's almost like a nickname and yeah. then the dependentistas who are sort of their friends slash rivals and then their real opponents you call the Chicago boys, right? These are the mm. sort of neoliberal economists coming out of the Milton Friedman circle, U of Chicago, you know, people we would today call neoliberals. You call, you refer to them many times as Chicago boys. And it sounded to me almost like this could be like West Side Story of like rival gangs. <laughs> and and I wondered like, is there a point to that? Is there, was that a choice to sort of use these informal, almost kind of personal terminologies to refer to people? Well, I have two reactions <laughs> to that uh, question. <laughs> One, I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize them as informal uh, necessarily, but I will explain where, it, where did they come from and, and why am I using them that way? I think they, I've, I've seen them, it's, 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 a, it's a guess, the term cephalinus has been used, not quite as extensively, but it has been used in the literature, and 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 it was actually used by one of them, Cepalinos, writing like in the 1970s. So say like maybe 20 years after their project sort of began, let's say, to refer to kind of themselves. So I or, or to refer to himself in that case, that particular uh, Chilean economist Aníbal Pinto sort of used the term to kind of uh, refer to himself. The reason why I wanted to use the term sort of cepalinos and dependentistas has has to do with like a methodological and I guess how do you call it, like historiographical intervention that I wanted to make with the book because a lot of these ideas had been sort of or or rather what we knew of cepal and dependency theory is the ideas is sort of the text and some reports and uh, some ideas that were in a way somehow it seemed to me when I first got into this topic like a little bit disembodied a little bit like a historical in a way I mean we obviously knew when they were coming from and that they were tied to this institution and there were there were things that of course were known and and there were things that were known for many of the contemporaries of course like you know um, things that would have been uh, obvious at the time but once you see like 50 years or 80 years from the moment, they weren't as obvious. I wanted to, to recreate this sort of lives of these people. And I didn't want to call them, just identify them as economists. For once, because some of them were not actually even trained as economists. Some of them were, but some of them weren't. They were economists by practice, by, by, by some of them had training, but, 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 but what they were doing, I guess they were interested in the economic world. And I guess, and that made them economists. And what, what really brought them together was sort of this institution and the network created around the institution. So hence the word Cepal and Cepalinos, that's what I tried to do. And the, the choice of dependentistas has some sort of similar idea, like it's trying to give this dependency theory a body and a history uh, in the human beings that created it, you know, like, um, I guess that that was sort of the, the, the idea be, behind that. And with regards to the Chicago voice, I think that it could be it was intentional in the sense that in some ways I was trying to avoid the term neoliberals because it seemed like it wasn't right like for that moment, like it would be not quite uh, correct historically to kind of describe in that way. They used uh, at the time they were they would use words like monetarist to describe describe these opponents that that I sometimes call the Chicago Boys. And I also use Chicago Boys because that was in fact the actual rival group. You know, the Chicago Boys were located in Chile, the same, which is not coincidental, that is the same location of the Cepalinos, like that the Chicago Boys are sort of a response to the growth of the Cepalino sort of intellectual movement and the institution and their influence. And so it was it's very i guess it's a, a rather than a kind of like informal i would say it's very like matter of fact <laughs> choice mm -hmm. that i used to kind of avoid some other sort of ideological misunderstandings or misalignments that that might not necessarily be inaccurate but are not 
as good descriptors of the reality of the time. Right. It might be distracting things into other places, other conversations, other debates. But in the same vein, I was struck by how there are so many visuals in this book. Mm -hmm. There are, Mm -hmm. you have a bunch of political cartoons from, uh, I think, a magazine called Revista Topaze. Yes. You you pulled out these cartoons about people talking about how to respond to the Cuban revolution and what to think about the UN and and also lots of pictures of these people at dinners, at conferences, <laughs> giving speeches, visiting each other's houses. Like I think one of the first ones is like some guys hanging out at Salvador Allende's house. Like, mm-hmm. and, it, and it struck me like, are you trying to convey here these were real like flesh and blood people and that it matters who knew whom, who was friends with whom Mm -hmm. And that social networks, it seems, you're trying to show like social networks had a real historical effect here. It was not just ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that was part of the reason. I also, uh, to kind of show these people in like um, real life, I did some kind of informal interviews uh, with Cardoso, one of the dependentistas that are uh, sort of exploring the book. And he talked about how he first, um, his first arrival from Brazil to Chile, they, he lived in, you know, Celso Portado and he shared a house and things were complicated. <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, <laughs> but um, that part does not include in the book um, yet because, well, you know not everything is for the book i'm saving it <laughs> but uh but but it is important i guess to show the relationships between them so that was definitely part of it and i think the cartoons me were like a absolutely incredible and joyful kind of encounter i guess with them and it happened very later on in the process they seemed to me to capture a lot of the sort of technical problems that I was trying to describe and that I had spent a lot of time trying distilling and making them as accessible with words as I possibly could. And then the cartoons just rightly summarize them in an image. And so to me, that was the greatest of finds. And to that, I, I owe it to a student, a master's student in Chile, Camila, who, who helped me find it because uh, this was in the middle of the pandemic also where I was sort of finalizing this book and and she was very she was very helpful and deserves a lot of of credit and i remember a few things that struck me one is you have a couple photos of celso Futado, the brazilian economist that i mentioned and he looks really sad like there's (laughs) one of him in front of a map of northeast brazil and then another where he's meeting with kennedy yeah and in both he has sad eyes and i think like okay Mm. This is the Meisel, right? (laughs) This is the guy who (laughs) was struggling uphill and became disillusioned. And one of the cartoons I loved was, I think it was Prebish trying to piece together a Latin American association. (laughs) The puzzle. Meanwhile, Eisenhower is piecing together the countries of Europe. And I had I had no idea that people saw those two things in comparison or in parallel, and that people really explicitly depicted the European integration as a sort of American-led project. <laughs> mm-hmm. which I guess maybe it's something Latin Americans were more conscious of than, than we are here. Yeah, um, for sure. But, but also one other thing, I think the first visuals are of the offices of CEPAL in Santiago mm-hmm. which are sort of ultra modern, especially mm-hmm. for that time, They're this kind of very austere, monumental kind of mid-century design. Is there a reason why you wanted those like up front for people to see that? Well, uh, yeah, I wanted to give this some sort of sense of place as well. And so that was kind of one of the reasons why I included the the images of the, uh, and I actually included the sketches of the building rather than a a photograph of the building um, itself. One, because I thought they were kind of more aesthetically appealing than a picture of of the building. I also found that um, this was this these sketches were part like of of a brochure sort of like uh, advertising the the construction of this building which actually happened like you know Cepal was funded in founded in 1948 and the building is I think finalized oof, now I'm blanking if it's in 1965 or 1967 but you know many years later 
Uh, so in a way, I sort of hesitated because I was like, well, a lot of the events that are happening in the book are actually not happening in the building. Uh, they're happening on the not even on the site of the building, like the Cepalino office was somewhere else in Santiago, not where the building depicted is located. But I thought of included it because one, it's beautiful. I, uh, I mean, I know some some people don't like like the modernist aesthetic, but I pretty much, you know, the cement and very like heavy and blunt, but um, structures. But I personally like it. But I also think it symbolizes sort of like the era, like you know, this hype, this this attempt of modernism that is both using one of the the products of industrialization like cement and making but also going back like some of the buildings of Cepal one has like a snail shape that's the assembly hall is a snail shaped hall and building and it has inscribed like imitating sort of prehistoric kind of inscriptions and like and so it's both these the past and the present kind of meshed or like meshed together and sort of going to the roots but also very much looking to the future so I I liked it and and I must say you know I spent a lot of time there so I wanted <laughs> I wanted that to be there to be there too so I want to maybe in for a few more minutes in current so you mentioned Colombia recently elected a new leftist a president and vice president Mm -hmm. And this happened almost at the same time, like right on the heels of a socialist president also being elected in Chile, right at the same time that there was a massive protest movement calling to replace the constitution in Chile. And as we're speaking now, they drafted a new constitution. It was just voted down. It was not approved by the voters. So they sort of have to go back to the drawing board. They're in this constitutional limbo. Yeah. But many people see so have sort of related these different events together in Colombia, in Chile, in Nicaragua, leftist president Nicaragua, and think that, well, there's like a shift going on in Latin America more generally, mm -hmm. that there's sort of a, a popular response happening to maybe the neoliberal era, uh, mm -hmm. and that maybe they can have a sort of new try, a new go at things again. Do you mm. see these things as part of a trend? Do you think, do you see these as part of a, a response maybe to the neoliberal era? I know that this is not your period, but how do you yeah. view these events? I, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and this also like, just to add one to the image, um, the potential election of, of Lula in a month uh, or so, well, Brazil is gonna have elections in, in October. So yeah, so adding to the picture. I, I don't think that's necessary, I mean, and I, you know, I'm not a sort of like political scientist, so I don't very much know. But I don't, I don't think that is necessarily a wave. It reminds me of there was this sort of wave called the pink tide, or this sort of when left-oriented um, governments were empowering a lot, a lot of the large countries and the small countries as well, in the early 2000s. And that was sort of considered like a kind of a break, a response to a neoliberalism and the start. So I'm a little bit hesitant to kind of rush to say the same thing about this this new wave, just because we 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 just we saw that happening um, in the early 2000s, and and not I guess I mean that's another story of like their successes and failures of these of this sort of wave. But I do find something very interesting and something that I'm very interested in pursuing is that the renewal of the language of development, because that seemed to me that kind of sort of disappeared. And, and Petro, as I was saying in the beginning, is trying to use that language. And second, he chose as Minister of Finance, uh, Jose Antonio Campo, who is a, a Colombian, Yale-trained economist, but who belongs to sort of this network of Latin Americans that I'm sort of interested in exploring that emerges in sort of like the late 70s and 80s. And Ocampo is or was um, a director, one of the director, um, executive secretary is called like the head of uh, CEPAL in the 2000s. And he has always sort of, despite sort of his like kind of North American, let's call training, 
he, he understands at least partially has seen similarity or resonance or identifies himself with some of the Cepalino ideas. So um, at that I'm interested in sort of tracing that um, legacy and to what extent can we talk about that as a legacy of Cepal or is like a transformation or an, an understanding more where Ocampo and uh, Petro fit into that longer trajectory of developmentalism in Latin America. So I, I was sort of a little surprised. I was looking around about Cepal and to see that they're still, they're still there, still working. Do you, do you think Cepal is still relevant and influential today? Or do you think it's kind of a shadow of what it was in the post-war era? You know, it's hard to say because, you know, when I was asked this question 10 years ago, I would say like, yeah, no, it's nothing like it. It's just, you know, it, like Cepal produces statistics, which are kind of a very important intervention for uh, Latin Americans to count with a series of comparable economic statistics about the region, like really have a map of the economic processes and how it was changing year to year, like sort of document that. And, and Cepal sort of did that in his early years and continues to to do this, to be this repository of information and to produce uh, important analysis about the different crises. So I would have said like, well, it's not like in the sort of golden years. And perhaps that is an accurate description. It's not like in its golden years, in part because it's bigger and more bureaucratized and many other things that um, happened over time. But I've also sort of been trying to follow more the afterlife of this institution and how did, you know, how what happens, you know, what happens to this institution after and, and to these intellectuals and ideas after its golden years, especially when there is a big push against those ideas. And I've seen, I'm starting to look at different points in time in which Cepal does, again, try to regain or reclaim the baton or something, like become a leader in some of the, dealing with some of the problems that Latin America face. So I think some of those are important and um, I am sort of willing to, or trying to figure out exactly what are those turning points and how impactful they are. And one one last idea I wanted to float, maybe see what you think about is, you know, in recent years in the US and in Britain too, to some degree, some commentators have said, well, these industrialized nations have become very unequal, right? There's huge concentration of wealth. There are problems with uh, public services being privatized and, mm -hmm. and the standard of living going down for many people. And they've argued sometimes in a very sort of crude way have said, oh, well, the first world places like the US are becoming like the third world. But uh, at least one, there's Alex Hokuli, who is a Brazilian writer who wrote an article in American Affairs last year called The Brazilianization of the World. And he sort of takes, he takes a lot of, I think, the dependentistas characterizations of Brazil and argues that they can apply now to the center nations, not just mm -hmm. peripheral nations, but even to center nations. And I'll just read a little paragraph from his article. He says, as for Brazil, people once thought that its promised future would materialize when it erased the core periphery division within itself, curing the problem of islands of wealth surrounded by oceans of poverty. Instead, it seems like it is the global north catching up with the global south and replicating this pattern. Brazil mm -hmm. is once more in the global vanguard. <laughs> so making this sort of ironic statement that we're, we're now catching up with Brazil. I mean, what do you, you've lived in Colombia and the United States. I mean, how does that strike you? Do you think there's validity there? I understand those, those statements and where they come from, but I, it's hard for me to make that um, comparison because I think that the, the levels of wealth and poverty are very different. And even though the inequality sort of like might be increasing in the within the countries of the global north, um, I think the level difference, like the sort of like um, absolute differences are still important and change the way in which we understand those those inequalities. So it's hard for me to kind of sort of imagine that that is necessarily like what's happening or there or that those two processes are equivalent. But it's a, it's a very interesting idea. 
and think about what it what it means and and the implications of this. I think it was very it is very true that perhaps inequality was something that was very obvious with it. Like they call it like in the Cepalino time, they call it structural het heterogeneity, like this difference mm -hmm. between the core and periphery within. That is something that only now are some of these other countries sort of discovering, in, even though I don't believe it hasn't been there. It's a matter of where you see it. I don't think this is just like, oh, suddenly there this, although we know that inequality has been increasing, it's also not that it didn't exist before these sort of gaps. So that's what I would, I would say. Yeah, and it seems to go back to this basic counterpoint that dependentistas were making to Cepalinos that you can't just talk about a country and how it fits in the global economy, but you also have to look at how the different groups and classes fit together structurally within the country and how mm -hmm. different populations are so, are positioned so differently within a given country. And it seems like a demonstration then again of how dependency theory seems to have this almost unlimited movability, right? That you can yeah. move it around and apply it anywhere. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think that's in a way that's, uh, I mean, somebody uh, when reading some of the versions of the manuscript at some point pointed out to me that that it seemed like part of the success of this language was that it that sort of transportability like that it can move and expand and be reimagined and be recast even kind of in intellectual ideological terms as well so so it, it is maybe that's you know going back to kind of like your earlier questions i guess is part of their successes it's kind of creating this language that that has that flexibility and that and and not just flexibility but sort of like i guess potential is the word like has something in that that can do much more than what it was born to do well, it's a huge pleasure talking with you. I know you have to go soon, <laughs> but is there anything else that, that you want to bring up or anything you'd mm. like to convey to people? That's a very hard question to end, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do I think? I would say that there was a lot of work on making some of these ideas that were sort of technical and kind of difficult to grasp or are or very um, kind of economic in nature and situating them in their historical and their political and social context and giving them some sort of life and texture and so i would just like to re-emphasize that to to people of how it's part of this book but i also i also think about that in my teaching as well like how do we make the world of, of economics and economists some sort of more tangible and accessible and and I think that is part of where this book is coming from and and that's increasingly how I see my own sort of role as a teacher not that I know everything about economics by any means but that is sort of a little bit of an objective behind it so that's that's what I would I would say to listeners well, it's a beautiful book. It was a real pleasure and a pleasure talking with you. And hopefully we will see each other in person soon. Soon. Yeah. God is coming. Cool. Cool. Thank you so much, Sam. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs>